Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Alex here. Those of you who've been uh, tuning in over the last, I think I make it 100 days tomorrow that we've been doing these live webinars here for the Festival Enterprise. So uh, thank you, those of us who, uh, those of you who've been with us during that time. Those of you who jump in for the first time as well, I can see people, um, Jill, just saying this is your first visit. Thank you for visiting us today. Um, so I'm Alex Chisnell. I'm joined by Piers Linney here today. Um, we're going to be having a discussion on why diversity is good for business. Uh, just to let you know, again, we're streaming this live Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. So if you want to be a little bit more interactive and you want to ask up any questions, literally go to festivaleventerprise.co.uk, register, jump straight in here where you'll get a link on your email. So I can see we've got loads of people jumping in already. So welcome to you all. Uh, recognize some familiar names there. So I'm broadcasting down from from here in Port in Dorset. And um, Piers, remind me whereabouts you are. Uh, I'm up in the northwest at the moment. Welcome, so you're, you're one of the few people, Alex, that Alex that needs a holiday. <laughs> <laughs> working oh. very hard, yeah. <laughs> Do you know what? I, mean, we've, I think everybody else decided to have a holiday here about a week or so oh, yeah, ago. Yeah. Um, the news, yeah. Which was which was not good, uh, <laughs> but we are talking uh, why diverse businesses are stronger businesses, they are more profitable, innovative, and smarter. Um, so just to frame this for you, so Piers was born in Stoke on Trent, but he grew up in former mill town in Lancashire, where he attended a local comprehensive school. So Piers, correct me if I'm wrong, but your mother is from the parish of Saint Philip in Barbados. Yep, she's from Bob Barbados. Don't forget, when she left there, it was still, you know, bananas and sugar. There was no tourism, but she left there in the 60s because she's a real Windrush generation. Yep, I was going to say, I saw you post up a couple of days ago, I think, um, about your mum on your on your Instagram. Um, and whereas your father was like working class Mancunian, wasn't he? And, but the first to earn. Class Man got a scholarship to Cambridge, speaks seven languages, including Russian. So, seven? Um, yeah, about seven. The last count, he keeps learning them. So, we had to, yeah, so my dad sort of, you know, he fell in love with this the woman from Barbados that he met. My mum was a nurse and he was uh, working in uh, exports. Well, my dad was in naval intelligence, so I never believe he was, he was working in exports at all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> how, how, many, like, how many languages can you speak, Piers? Uh, a bit of German. It's not, I can get through German, I told myself, and now I'm trying to learn Spanish. Are you? Yeah. yeah. Trying to encourage my kids to do something like that during lockdown, and they looked at me like I had grown two heads or something, saying, "Look, you're only doing being a Mandarin." Oh wow! Yeah, it's quite yeah, that, that, that would be useful. Um, John says, "I was also born in Stoke on Trent. Good to see a fellow Potter." Yeah, that is me. John. People I know are me, Robbie Williams. Or I don't know him. John Corwell phones for you, chap. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so I left Stoke, but we I moved up to Lancashire. So I did grow up in a mill town, like you say, and I was the, apart from my mum and my brother, who didn't go out as much as me and get involved, I was the only sort of black guy in the village. There's two and a half thousand kids in my school, a bit less than that maybe, and I was the only uh, kid there from a um, sort of Afro-Caribbean background. Mm, literally the only one. How old was your brother? What was the age difference? He's two, and two years younger than me, so he, he, yeah. he wasn't out and about in the town as much as me. Um, yeah. but it was interesting, but people talked about I, I kind of did some stuff on um, probably jump into this a bit, but I'll give you a bit of context. I put some the mm. when the George Floyd uh, murder, let's call it that, happened. Um, I put some people asked, well, what was it like for you? And I put a few things out there saying, you know, you, you know, what, eight, probably you know, eleven years old. You know, you, there's a dad and his son crosses the street and says to you, you know, you use the N word. You should get back to your own country. I've had police escorts home from school. I couldn't really hang around my local town. Now, some of that was kids, you know, just picking on you because you might be overweight or you might have ginger hair or you might, in my case, mm. I was sort of a different colour. Um, I had a, an air rifle pellet go from my hood um, when I was walking home from school. And there's always got things where, you know, you don't, when you were a kid, it was kind of part of the game. You didn't really think about it. Mm. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't every day, but as you grow up, um, you look back and think, you know, it, it was kind of there and I dealt with it. Now, not every young kid does. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, and, and I, I was brought up in in Cardiff, in in South Wales, and um, literally, e even though there was a significant Somali population in in Cardiff and working in the docks and stuff, in in my school again, it was like you know really big high school, but there were 
only two people from mixed race in the entire school in the entire school that, and that was literally you know my experience i guess growing up as a, as a kid in cardiff um and interested to know again i've you know we've done a few few bits and pieces together over the years of podcasts and events so i follow follow you on um on social media what's your experience been um putting stuff up and some of the reactions that you've got do you think and, I, and i've read some of them and it's like it's like some people don't actually believe the experiences that you've been well, through. It's, it's, it's an interesting one because I think the whole uh, you know, george floyd and his murder and the black lives matter so you know let's face it you know the, the news cycle will move on now the important thing is is to make sure that the the issue the diversity issue the inclusion issue this really revolves around social mobility that we don't move on from that because it affects us all which we can probably talk about so i thought about opportunity now to put some thoughts out there and some posts and i you know i put a few posts there's a great post i think um a great picture of all these sort of uh these sort of black guys and they're all standing there and they're all wearing black got t-shirts on looks like they all go to the gym and they're all standing on these sort of steps you say well who are these guys and i said well who are these people and people look at it and you make assumptions and we all mm. make assumptions I had a chat earlier about remember the it was on the news there's a chap and uh, he's, he's he's on the news and his kids come in the back door and this lady comes in and grabs his little toddler and sort of yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. And everyone's kind of like, oh he's been nanny grab the toddler like that's not his nanny that's his wife because she was tight or, or of asian yeah, origin yeah, yeah, so yeah. people they you make these assumptions that sometimes you just don't even know you're doing it so everyone mm. looks at this picture to make assumptions that you know they're a basketball team there's some large rap rap outfit or the singers or yeah. football or whatever turns out this is a you know a good part of the class of 2021 from harvard law school that's right i saw that yeah, yeah like that. what happens yeah. is is that people i've done it myself when i look at things like oh god you get this tingle down your spine of like oh my god i shouldn't have thought that i'm am i racing mm. does, does anybody know will i be found out yeah and, and people react quite um and some people embrace it and say you know what Piers, that picture really made me think that i've got I've got a bias as well. I need to go yeah. away and think about that. And some are like, well, obviously, you know, you, you, you've framed it in a certain way that you're going to think that. And you're like, well, why would you? So people mm. have people have this sort of, they get that, I call this sort of uncomfortable tingle down your spine, which is a good thing. And the secret is, is to think about why it's there, embrace it, think about it, and talk about it. So I've been sort of putting posts out. What's interesting, my social media following went down. So when I'm talking um. about, when I'm talking about, you know, um, loans or government support for small businesses that's fascinating when i'm talking about you know you need to embrace diversity and rid yourself of your conscious and unconscious bias um your following goes down even though actually there's probably in in many ways there's as much of a competitive advantage embracing that as we would working out to borrow money yeah 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 no, it was, it, that was interesting i haven't thought of that until i, I listened to a podcast um a guy a guy follow called andy frizella who's He's got a multi-million pound um, nutrition company called First Form down in um, right the Midwest in St. Louis in, in the States. And, uh, you know, he's got a couple, couple of million followers on on, on Instagram. Um, and he, like, co-hosts it with um, – he's now his, his head of security, a uh, uh, black guy there. But he they were both saying when they posted about, you know, uh, how well they're doing in the, in the supplement game people are following them or about entrepreneurship and then as soon as he started posting about george floyd and about his manner you could literally see people dropping off in the dozen people don't want to you know they don't want to hear it they want to yeah. uh, stick their head in the sand and, and move on and whether it's um whether it's about george floyd and black lives matter whether it's about you know actually in the us especially it's pretty acute there because uh mm. you know especially the government administration there there's been um the supreme court's had some rulings about um the, whether you can be fired because you happen not to be straight. You know, if you, if you come out as gay in the US until quite recently, amazingly, in quite a few states, you could be fired on the spot. So diversity is a very broad issue. Mm. And, uh, at the moment, there's a, a, a focus and a spotlight being shone on the, the impact of our bias and the, the lack of inclusion and the lack of diversity uh, around people who have of color, which are black. Now, people don't like using the word black they don't like using the word life. They don't mm. like talking about diversity. But at, at the end of the day, my view is, I always say this, until the top of our society, and be that UK boardrooms, be that education system, looks like the bottom of it, and, and it's equally, it's equal spread. And all that really is about is, is connecting 
opportunity, and we'll talk about the my secret millionaire experience actually, is connecting mm, yeah, um, opportunity with talent. As long as you do that and it's fair and it's a level playing field, um, we all do better. The economy is uh, more vibrant. There's more innovation. There's more people in work. Uh, there's more people making money. There's more tax paid. We're more mm. competitive and we're more relevant in a, in a global um, economy where, you know, we're going to struggle to stay relevant. There's a skill shortage coming. So by, by choosing people from your school or a similar school tie or they believe in the same God or the same sexuality or they support the same football team or the same colour or whatever or they haven't got dreadlocks in the hair or their hair's not blue. By limiting yourselves like that, all you're doing is limiting the talent pool that you have to go and fish in to build your business. At the end of the day, most businesses, most people watching this have got smaller businesses. Uh, inherently, success is massively correlated to the people working for you and, and the quality of them. And you kind of look at, you know, future solutions. And, and like you say, when you look at the UK PLC and the, and the, and the boardrooms, um, what do we do to what do we do to change it? Um, because I don't, I don't think just I mean, your kids, I think, are similar, similar age to me. Um, you know, I don't know what age people start judging people and you know i don't know what age you know people start you know building building companies and, and the, the way the way they end up with just a, you know the boardroom is literally just you know white male middle class uh, etc um what do you what do we do like future wise to actually start changing things where, where does it begin well so it's just a generational thing so you know yeah. you're not gonna- you're not going to go out tomorrow and, and you know come out with some quota system and chain to make up with the boards of the FTSE 350. It's not going to happen. So you're actually looking as far back, you know, as people in primary school. So a quick sidebar is um, I did the Secret Millionaire, and this is a, diff- this is a different story. And uh, I was a lot of it was shown I was in prison. I actually worked in the, in the local community with a um, Afro Caribbean mental health charity, and the preponderance, I think, of uh, mental health issues in black men is about seven times that of equivalent white men. And I was like, well, I said to the founder, who's a Rastafarian lady, I said, well, why is that? And she said, well, when you're young, when you're kids, you all think you're the same. You've all got the same aspiration. You want to be a fireman, or an astronaut, or a doctor, or whatever the hell it is, mm-hmm. um, or gamer these days. And, you know, you, you think you're the same. And as you begin to sort of go through life, you begin to realize, hang on a minute, there's something not quite right here. There's something different about you because mm-hmm. people who don't look like me, they're kind of accelerating away and getting on with their life, and I'm not. And if you're no fault of your own, because of the color of your skin or postcode you're born in some cases, some cases that there's a correlation there, um, you can't sort of, you, you can't basically, um, you have these aspirations, but you can't deliver upon them. So you begin to realize that I'm never going to be the person I think I could be or I wanted to be. Then you have some life some problem in life like a broken relationship or some kind of you lose your job or something and that triggers some kind of mental health issue and that was her hypothesis as to why that's the case and that always stuck with me that that, that's just not how um it should be yeah anyway to answer your question which i haven't done yet (laughs) (laughs) the point is it's very hard to change it but if you don't embrace it and talk about it and start doing something about it then it's never going to change and what's amazing is you look at the you know the us is a great uh, yeah because they've got a real history in terms mm-hmm. of uh, civil rights and you look at what's changed since the civil rights movement or what's changed since obama was president well you look in the uk at, you know the makeup of uk boardrooms where i think seven percent of FTSE 350 are uh, ethnic minority and most of those are running south african mining companies yeah or you know you look at um oxbridge how many people from BA BAME backgrounds are there or how many entrepreneurs receive black entrepreneurs receive institutional finance and if you actually start going for the numbers you look at the Nike board the Adidas board you know there's not a black face to be seen and you start going for the numbers and and the, and the way you know the system structured uh and it you know, it amazes me that there isn't change and amazes me that people aren't sort of really willing to keep holding these people's feet to the fire and making them accountable and that's what it's about so you've got to start with school and you've got to start with showing those role models and that you can be whoever you want to be there's got to be an equal path you should be able to be able to go to any of that's something you know education can be expensive so it's about how do you fix that you should be able to go to oxbridge no matter what socioeconomic background you came from what color you 
um, you are, although you, know, you don't all have to go to Oxbridge, obviously, to so be able to start a business and raise finance from institutional investors, no matter where you came from, what you look like. So all these barriers should be the same height for everybody. And then you've, you've got a fair crack at success or a fair crack at whatever career you choose to pursue. Then you get into, as you go along, it's about, okay, now, now as people are coming through, then it's about removing that bias, unconscious or conscious, whatever it might be, or institutionally even, that bias in the recruitment process. So that, you know, you have companies that don't put names on CVs because people might have a certain reaction to someone's called yeah, my yeah, yeah. you know. So mm -hmm. you got to change the game there. And then this will take a generation. But a lot of the, a lot of it in terms of the black community, especially as of my own experience, and that's why I've done TV and I've done certain things, is, is having positive role models, having people yeah. that look like you, that are doing things you aspire to do. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I can't remember who was saying it recently, but it be, whether it was somebody like Raheem Sterling, that you know, Man City football player, but you're saying, you know, black black role models need to be more than just footballers or boxers, for example. There yeah, I've, I've, been, I've said that quite a few times. People say, oh, what do you mean? It's better than nothing. I'm like, well, I agree. It's great to have, you know, uh, you know, sportsmen and people in the music industry or role models. But you do need people in boardrooms. You know, not everybody wants to be, you know, a football player or mm. a, a, an artist, a music artist. So people do want to be bankers, lawyers, you know, you know, entrepreneurs, you know, middle managers, whatever you want to do. Yeah. And, that's one of the big issues is th these people aren't visible. But I think the great thing now is, this is why I'm, I'm here talking to you, is about is having this conversation. People said to me, well, what do I do? How do I learn? You know, you, know, you can read books. But just, you know, everyone says, oh, oh I've got a black friend. <laughs> Go and talk to them. And don't yeah. talk at them. And don't say, well, oh, they're all white. They're all lives matter. Go and talk to people of colour, but not colour they are, actually, or even people of uh, different sexuality. Go and talk to them. And understand their experience and then through that i'll guarantee you it will change your perception of the world and, and probably change the way in which you go through life and which you interact with people or hire people yeah i'm just going to read out some of the some of the comments here we've got jill i totally agree why would you reduce the number of people prepared to work with you um juliet yes it's true about not being able to progress your aspirations because others clearly indicate you're rising above the expectation of you by others nationwide sent out voting papers and no diversity at all in any of the photos of the members uh warren hey do warren i totally agree head of black music and the majority of large um music corporations in the us are white um precious put positive role models are key to make those aspirations in the bame be attainable and relatable uh, juliet says i was a senior manager and the challenge then became avoiding being accused of favoring people who look like you for promotion um well, that was the problem is there is it's just human nature isn't it we're just mm. we're more comfortable with people that we think we understand because they look like us and do things that we like doing yeah you, when you, you like to fight to get over that sometimes and, and at what age then because you know when, you, when you're talking about back before being in being in school um and a number uh, of, of people in your school and at what age you kind of notice that different to everybody else and, and the aspirations that you have and, and people uh you know landing jobs or places at university and I, I wasn't i wasn't one of those kids so i kind of went through went through school and i kind of like you know yeah yeah that issue i became quite good at judo which was quite handy so and people didn't really mess with me they wouldn't mess with my brother because he was my brother so i became yeah. sort of like you know somebody don't mess with me really and I didn't really bother me. So I went to university and I, I struggled to get into university, got to Manchester eventually. I struggled to get into the city. I didn't go to the right school. You know, I didn't get the degree. I went did my A-levels twice. Um, I got one job in the city from 68 applications from one firm that believed into me, believed in me. Um, I struggled to get into investment banking. So people look at me and say, oh, well, you, you went to university, you did a, a law and yeah, yeah. degree, you became a lawyer, you went to, became a corporate financier, then you went to be a hedge fund manager. That's a very sort of um, standard path if you went to the right school, you know, yeah. well planned out. It wasn't planned out at all. It was a, a complete basket case. It was a mess. I, was, <laughs> I, I didn't know what a hedge fund was until I was in Credit Suisse. I didn't know what investment banking was until I was a lawyer. I didn't want a corporate finance lawyer. I didn't until I even start my law degree. You know, mm. but I meet kids now who are 13. They've got this all planned out. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So I, I didn't really realize. It was only really when um, I was asked to be a government role model for young black men and boys in about 2008. 
And I said, well, why do you want me to be a role model? And I well, look around you. How many people are there who look like you that have done what you've done? And mm. I looked around and thought, oh, actually, you're right, actually. Yeah. And then, you know, I ended up, you know, doing TV, I did Secret Millionaire, and we'll come back to Daniel in a minute, and um, Dragon's Den, you know, I do tick some boxes, clearly. Yeah. Um, and now I've, I've been looking to, you know, join the boards of some companies. I haven't quite found the right one yet. I'm on the board of British Business Bank, which has been fantastic. Got a very yeah. diverse board there, a group of people. And mm. we've been working, um, you've been working hard. I've been working hard on board <laughs> meetings about putting together bounce back loans and C bills and CL bills and future fund. So yeah. people have been working with that's a, that's a great one. But even I find it, I'm just going to put it out there. I find it quite hard, right? Um, to find like non exec positions um, for myself, even though I've got a really? background, you know, they might think some geese off telly, but yeah. I'm not really. That was like, you know, a couple of weeks of my life. I spent most of it being a professional. Mm. And even then it astounds me when I talk to people, I talk to headhunters and they can look at me and they don't really know where to pigeonhole me. Mm. And they say that to my face and I'm like, well, okay. Um, so I, I've, I'm kind of, I'm out there looking for those kind of roles and even I struggle with it sometimes. Didn't know that. Hmm. So, uh, so, so the point is, also, I never really realised until quite late on, late on because yeah. I, I was kind of tunnel vision. I was just getting on my life I could see an obstacle and I'd fight my way over it or through it or around it or under it. My brother is a bit more um, thoughtful than me, shall we say. You know, he was at university thinking about these things. Um, mm -hmm. you know, he's, he's black, he, he's gay, and he was thinking about these things a bit more deeply where I was just soldiering on. It was only yeah, yeah. later in life I had to take stock. And that's where I sort of, you know, um, founded the Leto Foundation, which is about social mobility, um, did TV, Partly because I was asked to, but partly because I wanted to be a role model. Yeah. Well, it's good to know that I wasn't the only one who failed my A-levels as well. Yeah. I failed, I failed my A-levels, my A-levels. I, I, mean, I, was, I, was, I was good at, I could get there in the end, as intelligent, but you know, I had to be pushed along, actually. Um, uh, whereas a lot of people, young people, they don't have that um, ability to do that. They, they give up. So yeah. let's talk about Daniel, we won't get time. So very quick one, because it's quite a long story. I did, I put it on Twitter, actually, there's a link. So I did The Secret Millionaire. I'm in a prison, young offenders. I meet this young lad. He's a black lad from Wolverhampton. And he's he's helping um, this, the other in, inmates, prisoners. They're all up to the age, about 19 there, roughly that age, to read. Very intelligent. Um, you know, he, I had a great conversation. I thought, what the hell is he doing here? I thought, what are you doing here? Anyway, cut a long story short. He was at school. He wanted to be a barrister which is kind of wrong home because I wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to be a barrister. I looked into it. I realized it cost too much money. Everyone told me, people like you don't become barristers. You're wasting your time. So then he wanted to go into IT. He went to college. He, he couldn't afford the, um, the change the rules on funding your bus fare or something. So he couldn't afford to go. The teacher was putting on DVDs and going outside having a fag. So he kind of gave up on that, did a few stupid things, make some money like his mates did, got caught and got quite a long prison sentence. Mm. I said, well, what do you think? anyway, so he, I said on the program, I said, I want to help the prisoners. Of course, the producers had a fit. You can't give money to prisoners. So I said, right, okay, when you get out, come and see me, and I, I will have a chat. So he gets out. I um, take him into my business. I let my team interview him because he was interested in IT. They say, we think he's great. I said, well, don't give him a job because of me. Um, let's put him on permission and see how good he is. So he shone, did really well. I uh, worked for me for about two years. Then I made him redundant, believe it or not, um, because it, his, his kind of part of his business we sort of shut down. Right. And then he started his own business. And then he's now gone back to be working for other people. And now he's earning about twice the average UK wage. He's probably actually earning more than I'm earning right now, to be quite frank. And um, he, he's doing really well for himself. And he'll probably, at some point, be earning 100 grand a year quite easily. And he'll probably go into business. Now, right. the, that story is, it's like that film sliding doors. Mm. So many Daniel end up in the criminal justice system. Yeah. Most people there actually did look like me, although they were black, in that, in, in that younger Fenner's institution. And he would have not been able to get a job, not been able to get on in his life. Now he's got, he's got a, a partner and a young baby now as well. And he would have ended up back in the criminal justice system because he didn't want to make some money because, you know, he was a bright lad. He'd try to be something clever, probably get caught again eventually. And then he got this cycle and his life's ruined and he's yeah. not – contributing to society whereas got another path where he's got a bit more um social capital which i basically gave to him connections mm. uh possibilities opportunities i hand in that he grabs them like a flipping willy wonka ticket runs with it and now 
He's uh, doing really, really well for himself and he is contributing to society we all live in. Yeah. And that literally is just, that's just me providing that access. And that's what you have if you have in the US, and they call it, um, talk about it quite a lot. That's what you have if you have social capital, you have networks, you went to the right school, your parents had a job and they know people. Um, he didn't have that. And how, how much of that, um, as I mentioned it before, but you, you mentioned it now, so let's touch on it now. So how much of that is the connections that you have? And again, you know, when do you, when do you kind of start so you can't you, you can't underestimate that. So in, in the Aleto Foundation, have a look at it, A-L-E-T-O, we have a sort of graph and it's got the kind of it's like a trajectory and it shows that if you come from you know you're um not of ethnic minority, got a reasonably stable socioeconomic background, your trajectory in life, be it career or business, looks like that. If you don't come, and the numbers prove this out, you know, not making this up. If you come from a, a more difficult background or you know, you're uh, to lower income or you're from an ethnic minority, and often those are inextricably linked, yeah. your trajectory looks like that. Hmm. Now, by providing access to opportunity, contacts, you can move it up. So you're basically closing the gap. And that really is social mobility. All you're asking is that, yeah. you know, you and your children should be able to have more opportunity and be able to make money and earn more money than you ever did. And the point I make to people is when you've got your kids and you, know, you think, well, actually, you know, I've got it quite easy. I don't need to worry about it too much. You don't know if your son or your daughter um, or your ex who's lived with your son or your daughters is going to end up in a relationship with someone, a person of color and maybe have children of color. So, you know, you just don't know. We're living in a melting pot, um, globalization. We're all going to be the same color one day. So yeah. you need to realize that you can't just hide your head in the sand because you're doing all right and not worry about everybody else. I think we've got an mm. obligation to, and I've got an interesting, um, I, I'm sort of, I'm half West Indian. My mom's from Barbados. She was kind of the matriarch of the family, I suppose. My dad's a Mancunian. So I, I've been brought up in quite a white environment. But I feel mm. very comfortable in Barbados or in an environment with people of, of you know, of Caribbean um, heritage. So I've got the ability to fit into both worlds. People don't. Yeah. Feel very uncomfortable in 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 each world, and people feel. And a lot of it is really is about these inbuilt. You can read books about this. It's an inbuilt going back a long way into history, you know, back to slavery even. This mm. inbuilt stereotype of different. Um, ethnic minorities that is just there in even children's storybooks from the time we're kids yeah no no you're no, no, right and where, where do you stand um just because i saw it again yesterday it reminded me that the police were trying to charge somebody for sticking that statue in in in, in bristol of uh of colston in, in into the river there about you know people saying about you know rewriting history and those things oh you know because my, my, my brother's boys go to Colston School in Bristol, and he said the headmaster was asked a couple of years ago to change the name of the school, and he refused to do it. Um, and I thought, I bet you'd be a different question now that that will be asked. Whether, whether yeah, I'm, I'm a bit of a boy. I like history, so yeah. Um, so. I think I think in the moment there are some obvious characters that shouldn't be stuck on pedestals and can mm. be thrown into a river. However, I think you know history. You know, you have to. It's very hard for us sitting here today to understand the context of the time he's going to put. I mean, America have got, you know, four named after Confederate um, generals, which is just nonsense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in the UK, you've got all the statues. I would take some of these statues down, but I would put them into some kind of institution or museum and explain why they were put up in the first place and why they're now in a slightly darker room mm. museum and who these people were. But the danger is, you know, people think they're clever pulling down, you know, a particular statue or... Uh, if you start digging, yeah, in 18, I forget the numbers wrong now, 1830s, whenever it was, um, there was um, a payment made to slave owners. Now, they're never actually supposed to be able to own these human beings, but they were paid compensation. And it's equivalent today of a couple of, several billion, I think it was 20 million, right. like three, four billion. And that went to about 600 companies and families. Yeah. That was a lot of money in those days. So mm. if you go back and, and you actually extract and start tracking through time where that money went to, it's going to turn up in some very uncomfortable places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Colson is it? He was, it was, it, you know, a lot of these companies had royal, you know, they had royal charters. So you, mm. know, you know where that's going. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You got, to be, you got to be, you got to be understand the history and the context. I think some yeah. of these characters should, should, probably shouldn't be put on pedestals. 
Um, mm. But they saw themselves not as a philanthropist of, of the time, but they made their money in a way which we found completely unacceptable today. But back in the day, it was very acceptable. Yeah. Um, let's dive into uh, some of the questions from, from the audience. To, uh, let's have a look. So I've got some of the private questions here, but let's have a look. Tom says, first question we've got, Tom says, I've been extremely uncomfortable hearing the word, B, the word B-A-M-E since the word came out of media a couple of years ago. I also don't like the business funding offer saying especially for B-A-M-E, although I am qualified for it. May I hear your view? So... If you can't measure it, yeah, you can't manage it. And the powers that be have to measure it um, to manage it. And, and we want them to do that. So they have to come up with some way of, of putting, um, a measuring change. So you've got, you know, black, Asian, minority, ethnic, and there's lots of other sort of, um, um, you can bake that down even further. But at some point, you're going to have to put people into sort of some kind of pigeonhole. It's unfortunate, but mm. that's the way it is. And I think that over time, that may become... Um, it's slightly more broken down, but for now, it's not ideal, but I think it works. Okay. Um, Shirley. I mean, sorry, I, I, when the world's improved, I used to, I spent when I was growing up looking at forms all the time, thinking, which box do I tick? Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, yeah. I tick boxes. And, yeah. and now, at least I can tick boxes. I mean, that's the, it's, it, it's a small improvement, but it, it's definitely a, a moving in the right direction. Mm. Uh, Juliet says, I, I knew once I went to primary school, older children made it clear that I was negatively different. Shirley, uh, sounds like an amazing career path. Uh, Beatrice says, let's start by scrapping off all those questionnaires at the end of every single application to schools, universities, surgery about what ethnic or religion you come from, um, which we were just... Um, I mean, they, they, they should, you know, ju just be because the nature of the beast in terms of bias, they should really take all of that off these applications. So, you know, name, any way in which you can, a, a human, someone who can read it and make, I mean, you're always going to be able to, just because of what school you went to or what, what town you grew up in or what your postcode is. But yeah. we should try and remove as many of those as possible because mm. humans just can't help it. They just trigger things that they've been, so they've been programmed into them from the day they were born. Yeah, no, right, you're right. Uh, Tom, who, who just asked that question, says, me too. Thank you, Piers. Um, and uh, okay. Actually, the big point is, we've kind of touched upon it. Let's just say it, put mm -hmm. it out there, is that if you're in business, if you're an employer, yeah, you have a huge amount of power. If you are building a business and you want to hire a team, your success is going to be, as I said, inextricably linked with the quality, uh, the loyalty and the amount of, graph your team and, and, and the capabilities put into building your business so people are fundamental if you're an employer uh you're doing yourself your career and your employer a disservice by not absolutely rinsing all the talent you possibly can out mm. of the pool you're targeting and finding the best you might find some that aren't i mean you know you if you're recruiting you're probably telling to suck eggs here you might find people that aren't quite right we mm. tell that because it's been harder for them to get into that room with you that they're hungrier and that's why i got my job in law i got into the room and i said to them look i've had 50 of these flipping interviews right and i'm not getting anywhere fast i can do this job give me a chance and if i fail you can fire me and they, i remember the partner in tax and the other chap there actually i actually know to this day he they looked at each other and said and they nodded and said good answer and that's what got me the job Wow. <laughs> and if, if you're in business, same thing. Mm. Uh, Precious says, the NED discussion is an interesting one. I have an issue with the adverts that states BME background is preferred, but the shortlisting only includes uh, BME, but never getting to the final interviews. I tick two boxes. I'm a black woman with a D-suite experience. I too am struggling in that space, keen to find my land. Uh, NED position, but always stumbling at the final step. The reasons are not so convincing as to why I didn't make the final cut. Well, I mean, I, I don't know your personal circumstances or your CV, so I can't really comment on that, whether there's a fit for that particular role. But, you know, let's face it, um, I think organisations are beginning to realise that they can't just keep putting the day off where they mm. have to embrace diversity and inclusion and, you know, do their part to make sure that 
everyone has access to the, the ability to be socially mobile. So right now, if you're, if you're a person of color from a BME background, it's probably not a bad time to try and go and get a non-exec job or become a consultant or to yeah. make yourself known, put your hand up. You know, you might not get it. It's about down to the person with it. Uh, all I'm saying is, is that it's about the person with the who's best for the job, who has the, the, the capability, the experience, the networks, whatever it might be. But just make sure before you make that decision that you've probably had to work a little bit harder to go and cast that net a little bit further and um, make sure that you are covering the ground you should be doing. Mm. Uh, Robin says, uh, a tangent here, I know, but have you also considered advisory board roles as well as well as NEDs? Um, Precious puts, I've started looking at trustee positions and advisory board roles recently. And then thank you, Janet Smith Morrison has posted up women boards, the women in business network as well. So thank you for uh, effectively networking on here and connecting people. That's great. Um, uh, Terence says, what is the best method to connect with Mr. Linney in relation to non-executive positions? Uh, LinkedIn. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Okay, I'm going to dive in here. We've got a few more questions. Um, what role, this is from Ket Patel, what role do senior people of colour have to challenge their organisations? Many people of colour have been appointed DNI roles, but has the game really changed under their influence? If not, why not? What, what is not working? That's a good question, that. And I, mm. I think that if you are a person of colour in a role like that, well, actually, let's rewind, right? If you're a person of color or, you know, you're, you're diverse, whatever way it might be, an organization, you have, you have a responsibility almost to ensure that people of who are diverse people as well have the same um, opportunity that you had as well. So you can't just get the job and sit on your hand and think, phew, I'm here now. Let's just keep my head low and keep the job. Um, you, you've got to really get out there and shake things up. And that's where you're going to see change. And I had a question. I'm just going to scroll back up. Uh, where was it? Where was it? Where was it? Um, Ashley says, do you, Piers, do you have any view on the elements of the privileged society, in particular public versus private schools? Um, well, I've got daughters in uh, free playing school. So I went away absolutely... I'll just say, you know, it was a, a rubbish, rubbish school, I'd say, and it's struggling to this day. It was in special measures a couple of years ago. Every couple of years, I go back there. Um, I had, a, I'll tell you a story, another one, so sidebar. So I was, uh, I got a, a, a DM, some, some dad said, follow me, DM me. And he said, my son is just failed his 11 plus, which another exam I also failed, by the way. He fell on 11 plus. He's going to your old school, which is a comprehensive secondary modern school. He's absolutely distraught. I think he might be on the spectrum slightly and he was can't get any sense out of him can you help but i said get him into my office so get him in the office I said right you're going in you know it's, it's school the teachers are there teachers exist to help you succeed they're not trying to ruin your life so don't worry about that put the hours in put the work in focus on what you're good at and in five years time you'll see you'll be absolutely fine five years later um this is now probably six years but five years later about last year he gets the gcc results I think he's like, you know, eight A's, whatever it might be. And now he's going on to do the apprenticeship, the job of his dream. He wants to work in engineering or something like that. And he's a fantastic example of someone where he has someone like me, you know, his parents, obviously, who said to him, don't worry about it, focus, work hard, don't be distracted. And no matter what school you go to at the end of the day, you can succeed. Having said that, it's a lot easier to get into certain places if you have the right school tie. And you, yeah. even the way you speak, even the way you look, even the way you wear, you know, wear your jumpers over your shoulder, you know, mm -hmm. it is, you know. Now, yeah. I, I was a bit cute about it. I, I kind of looked at the people and thought, well, I, I need to be a bit like you, actually. So I would kind of PR myself, my CV a bit, in the way I was. I changed my voice. I, I kind of use a lot of bath, laugh. I have a few yeah. Macarenias, and I'll probably go back to the short A. So I kind of changed myself, actually. And people say to me now, well, you know, you know, you know brother, I'm going to change myself. You know, they don't want me, they don't get me. I'm like, absolutely fine. But right now, the law firm that gave me the job many years ago became my lawyers. And it wasn't the case. And I hadn't sort of PR myself a bit and played the game. That mm. wouldn't have happened. So 
Absolutely. Our system uh, is based on privilege. If you've got the money, the background, the school, the education, and that is going to take, let's not kid ourselves, generations to change. Yeah. But there's no reason why we can't start today. Mm. And what are we now? Like I said, three months plus into uh, you know lockdown, possibly coming out the other side by the looks of things. <laughs> Um, what do you think the impact of, of COVID pandemic is, is going to be in, in accessing that talent, whatever it is? Because clearly, recession, tip of the iceberg is seeing like the jobs today, you know, Airbus, Harrods, you know, all these companies releasing EasyJet, you know, another one, Virgin Atlantic, which is, you know, close to my heart. I've got so many, so many friends have been there 20, some even past 30 years, you know, got the carriage clock, you know, over Easter, and now they've literally been made redundant. And, um, you yeah, what do you think the impact's going to be um, and, and trying to so, access that time? You know, it is going to be, going to get worse where it gets better. Yeah. You know, the, the government, you know, did what it could do to support people through a difficult period of time. But we are going to come out of that, hopefully. Although the problem with COVID is until the whole world sorts it out, we're always still going to be at risk. So mm. COVID might not go away for a long time. But from an economic point of view, is that it's going to get become very difficult. You know, people are going to come out of furlough. They're going to realise there aren't jobs. A lot of businesses aren't, aren't going to. They're not going to make it. So we're going to go into quite a long recession. It's going to be a very deep recession. Um, so I think what COVID has done though is speed up the sort of technology technological advancement in many ways. So right now, I, I did a call this morning, and it was on. A, I spent ten years of my life trying to sell unified communications and video conferencing and you couldn't get people to use video i think oh i don't like it how'd you do it they wouldn't do it it was a nightmare one of our biggest bugbears i had a call this morning and i wasn't on video because um i had to go in a different room because the, some guy was making noise outside and it wasn't the room wanted to be have on video as a bedroom basically so i was on voice and i felt bad about it it was like oh god so what you're going to see actually is that covid you know be it things like the use of cash for example things like uh, video conferencing, things like the ability to have distributed businesses where you don't have to have an office anymore. I think I think it's, it will end up killing offices. I've always said work mm. is something you do. It is not somewhere you go. The yeah. office was a construct of a time where you had to have scribes, had to go to a particular building because that's where the pens and paper and abacuses were. So uh, th those days are over. So I think that's going to change massively, which is not good if you're in... Um, you know, if you let out property. Yeah. Going back to talent and diversity, I think that what you can now do is you have no excuse now because people are getting used to this, essentially. You have no mm. excuse now not to use this technology to say to people, I don't care where you live. Uh, if you can do the job, you're the best person for the job, no matter what color, creed, or God you believe in, I will give you this job and you can work from wherever you are. That actually is a game changer. Because a lot yeah. of people, just commuting can be expensive. Commuting can be, the, the need to commute can be a, a limitation on someone's career and their ability to do what they, to actually, you know, to sort of maximize their potential. So mm. that, I think there are two examples there. There's lots of other ones about, you know, money and cash, those kind of things. But I think COVID is going to speed up technological advancement in, in, in many ways, ways you don't understand yet. Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of waiting, you know, having done so many of these, and I know you've done quite a few as well, but kind of waiting for that company, you know, whether it's Zoom improving their offering or, or whoever, but actually, you know, utilising um, virtual reality or something. You actually feel, you know, if you, you're at a networking event or you're in a room with somebody, because it's still quite... I mean, I mean, the technology we're using right now, you know, whether it's, you know, Cisco, Microsoft, Zoom, whatever it might be, it, it, it's... It's early, early days. This stuff. It's mm. only. It's like any other technology, isn't it? it? Takes a long time for it to be sort of to get those early adopt past the early adopters and to be picked up. And once yeah. it is, it, it really takes off. You will see a huge amount of uh, development now in the ways in which we can communicate with each other without actually being able to be in, have to be in the same room. And, and that's going to be a game changer. It's something that should have happened a long time ago, which hasn't. But from yeah. a different perspective, though, you know, go back to that, put a positive light on it if we can. Recessions could be a good time to start a business. Recessions could be a good time to take a good look at the business you've got if, if you can make sure it survives. Because, you know, it changes the dynamic. And at the end of a recession, if you're still there, um, or if you can downsize your business and survive, there'll be less competition. But, you know, economics 
it cycles, you know, it, it will come back. It's a question of being there or creating a business which can actually um, help people themselves get through this difficult period because people will, even with limited funds, they'll pay for that. Yeah, and there will be, like, like you say, you know, businesses that come out of this recession that do incredibly well, just like in the last one, we, we you know, had the, the likes of the Airbnbs and the Ubers and, you know, chatting to a mutual friend of ours, Al Barrett from Grenade, you know, he started 10 years ago. In, yeah, exactly, in the last they did, yeah, doing incredibly well. Yeah, I've, I've, I've looking to start a business before COVID to like an SME service provider, and that COVID came has uh, kind of got mothballed a bit. But now you look okay. at it, you think actually, you know, small businesses, um, small business owners, and their networks, they need support more than ever. And large mm. companies don't always understand them. And a lot of the the large companies that they're sitting in their supply chain, a lot of them are going to suffer. Mm. Uh, Chris says, you mentioned peers the success by going the IT route. I worked in the IT sector for 30 years, including the Bank of England, IBM and other IT divisions in smaller companies and have found them to be very diverse and open. But going out into non-IT divisions in such companies, I've found them to be more close to diversity in both colour and gender. Perhaps IT as a relatively new industry doesn't have the negative history and carry any stigmas in this respect. How do you work this back into other sectors? Well, weirdly, I, I worked in IT and tech. This is more like enterprise tech than kind of, you know, the next Airbnb. And I always called it male, pale, and stale. Uh, that was the industry. I used to go to more ceremonies, you know, there'd been a thousand people there, and there'd be very few women there, very few people of color. Um, so the tech industry, actually, and it's different now. If you're talking about software and software developers, then you'll see many more people there with. Um, ethnic minority backgrounds, but the tech industry in terms of management and enterprise tech uh, is very much still male pale and still. A lot of work to be done there. Hmm. Um, Warren asked a question, <laughs> hashtag oldpreneur. What's Piers' thoughts about age diversity in business? Well, I'm getting on now, so I'm thinking about it a bit more. <laughs> I'm older than I look. <laughs> so again, it goes down to the point of um, if you're an employer or you're in business, um, same thing, and you want to access the best talent to do the job, um, that's what you should do. And you shouldn't be looking, you should be looking at their ability. Clearly, you know, do they fit the culture? But the, do they fit the culture shouldn't be that, oh, people here might be a bit concerned by hiring someone that's openly gay, for example, or black um, or, or, or a woman. So, because it's quite laddie in the, in the office. So even that stuff, you need to get over it. And that's what people need to do. It's quite simple. It's just get over it. Mm. Um, Aideen says, would you say the interview process is favoured by the majority of companies these days also plays a part in the problem? For example, the relatively new trend of multiple interviews per role, Google being a good example. If we want diverse employees, shouldn't we also employ diverse hiring practices? Yeah, so, yeah, if, if you're sifting through lots and lots of different CVs, um, it can be, you know, you, you can miss the, the diamond in the rough, so to speak, but it is about process in large organisations, about how they go about it. But I actually think that if you, if you, you could have a process here, but if you're still casting the net as far as you used to, you're going to see the same fish. I think you mm -hmm. have to actually work a little bit harder, and that means you know, resource and money and time um, in organisations. You're going to cart a net a lot further out and a lot wider. And there you're going to see lots of different sorts of fish. And then you can mm. make, the, make the, the, the recruitment decision and you can actually take out the bias in that process, change the process clearly. But the process is only a small part of the problem. It's about how far your net, the metaphorical net, is actually reaching. And um, it would be remiss of me not to ask you whilst, we, whilst we've got you on here and we've got about another seven, eight minutes left, but well, what, have, what have you been working on um, with regards to uh, your role with um, British Business Bank and any any initiatives or, or stats that you want to share with us on, on that front with uh, Bounce Back, et cetera? So, uh, well, and all the stats, I'm not sure they're all public yet, but if you follow British Business Bank in terms of the, the, the amount of support, this is the government generally, actually, because it is owned by the government, has uh, put into supporting businesses, <laughs> Um, it, it's huge and it's it's a real game changer. So that that will change quite a few things, but that will that will only go so far. So I, I've taken time out really. I've been, because you can only do so much. I've been working on a couple of businesses I'm involved in um, to really 
get them, we're going to race them. There's a, there's a mountain bike company I can't help but mention, Atherton Bikes. Atherton so bikes. We've, we've been really, really made some progress on that on the product and launched the product now. So we're probably going to start uh, looking at funding that, maybe maybe crowdfunding as well. Mm. But uh, I've been involved in sort of well-being and food. So there's a business there. It's a new business. So I've been taking the time actually to talk because you can actually get a hold of people. So talk to people, <laughs> yeah. um, do some research because, you know, sometimes what else is to do? Do some research. Uh, and put together a couple of new businesses. I've been working with a very old friend of mine called uh, Charles on SEN, SEN. So that's, uh, I, I think this is the real potential UK, Clark and Well, London, space, space unicorn. So we're putting um, live, we're putting CubeSats into space to provide live streaming of Earth. So think of uh, Google Earth, but actually a live version of it. And that'd be mm. available to businesses and also apps on your phone so we're working with charles and that as well but the one i've been sort of started work on again the last couple of weeks is this sme business it's about trying to use my network and expertise my profile to some extent to build a service provider for small businesses and again i'm using my background in telecoms and mobile and uh, it to put that together so that's something i need to do they probably need a bit of real money in that one so that'll be another fun so i'm spending most time with actually raising finance I mean, my, my LinkedIn inbox full of people asking me for money. <laughs> so, yeah. Meanwhile, yeah. you're doing yeah, the other opposite. Yeah, yeah. It's a good, opp good opportunity to do something new. I think, you know, and at the end of the day, right, if you're looking at losing your job and that's painful, uh, I've been there once, twice in my life, it's painful and there's not much there in terms of other, other work, then, you know, one option is to think about how do you put together your skills, expertise, network, something you like doing, the people you know, and trying to build your own business. Because we said another podcast, you Alex, that, you know, we're all going to end up working for, all, the gig economy is coming for us all. You know, the idea of a job is it, going to be short-lived. And the thing about diversity as well, because if you think really far out, there's going to come a day whether it's AI or robots, we can talk about that in a different, <laughs> different um, webinar. But... Mm -hmm. It's going to accelerate away. So the people who have actual jobs will be the lucky ones. And it's about what happens to the, the rest of us. And if we don't fix um, the diversity issue before that day, that inflection point, then there's going to be a lot, many, many people from diverse backgrounds that are left behind when that ship leaves the harbour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so any any last questions coming up to, to the hour, folks? I've got a question um, surely can't have a webinar without somebody asking Dragon's Den questions, so I'll, I'll put it out there. What's been your most profitable, um, what is, which was your most profitable Dragon's Den investment from Paul? It's been quite interesting, guys, because it's been it's been back on TV on Sunday night. Yeah. Yeah, I did the reruns because I couldn't make it because of COVID, so it's been quite funny watching myself. Um, right. I look quite fat, actually, I thought, <laughs> in the first one. And... Uh, the one, the most successful for me was, um, it was, it was called Lost My Name. Now it's called Wonderbly. Yeah. And they sold, you know, I don't know what the numbers are now, but five million books in flipping several hundred countries. The revenues in the tens of millions, you know, Google invested money. So, you know, they're still building the business. Some, some, still somewhere to go. But that is a huge success story now, Dragon's Den. It's quite interesting, actually, because a lot of them, they talk about the big success stories and they don't really, I don't often see that one in there. But that mm. is a real UK tech success story. It's making money now. Um, it is it's changing the way in which you know children actually interact with books, uh, and basically it's personalised content. And they've also just done a deal now where they create a platform where any publisher can use their technology now. This is the real growth opportunity mm. to make personalised books. So the first one they've done is with a uh, Wizarding World which is a oh, Harry wow. Potter online. So when yeah, you buy yeah. the wizarding book, whatever it's called, I'm, I'm a Harry Potter fan. And, and it, that book is actually um, produced with all that personalized content. That's done using the Wonderbly platform. So that's a huge growth opportunity. So I've yeah. done, pretty, done pretty well out of that one. Um, but you never know until the fat lady sings, do you? No, indeed. No, I've ended up having to watch all of the old Harry Potter movies with my, with my youngest daughter over, uh, <laughs> over COVID. So I'm fully up to date on all that. Um, Chris says, sounds like I was lucky working in some rather enlightened companies, which is sad um, as those from an ethnic and non-male background brought different ideas and concepts to the party, enabling a more lateral approach to the build and design of systems. Um, somebody asked a question, where was it? Janet Smith Morrison says, do you have a mentoring program I can tap into, Piers? I, I don't have one. I'm a, I'm a 
founding trustee of the Leto Foundation. So have a look at that. So we're actually doing a summer school, which is sponsored by BT. Um, and that starts the end of the month. So that's usually physical. Um, this year is virtual. So I've got a, I'll have a team of um, young people. It tends to be a diverse group. Uh, so the second year university students typically. Mm -hmm. um, and we basically have a, a challenge and they work on for three days. And I support them and mentor them. So that's one. Um, but uh, there are lots out there. But that's the one that I'm involved in. Because um, I think we started that sort of 10 years ago. Yeah, awesome. Um, and yeah, lots of thank yous, really thought provoking discussions. Thank you, Piers from Juliet Precious. Fantastic discussion. Thank you, Piers. Yeah, and the key thing is because I'm going to tell Alex going to turn me off is it no, matter, yeah. matter who you are, what color you are, sexuality you are, what God you believe in, everything. I think you need to sit down and, and take stock of that and understand that we are all biased and realize that even if it's quite difficult and even if you might find your family don't like like you're doing it you need to think about how you rid yourself of that and make and make sure that change is pervasive through everything you do because if we all do that it changes society and you know when you say oh what can i do about changing the world you can start by doing that yeah no absolutely agree with you um so precious is Put up the Aleto Foundation there, uk. Thank you, Precious, for being on the ball there. Um, and yet, you know, what are your thoughts on the Black Lives Matter movement? Um, and, the, and the wider question of diversity, because, you know, we've, we've all saw the scenes in, in America and then we've ended up, you know, in this country with, with a number, well, not just this country, it's been all over the world, isn't it? I've seen people having yeah. different marches and protests as well. So, I, I think from Alex, I think that two things. Let's 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 confront the all lives matter comment. I, I see a lot on my social media. Yeah. So the, the 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 analogy is as I've used is where you know the house house is on fire, the family standing outside watching their life, their, you know, all their life's belongings burn in front of them. They call the fire brigade. The fire brigade come herring down the road to put this fire out. Some neighbour comes trotting out with a cup of tea and a. And a you know, a, a cookie and stops the fire and they say, well, hang on a minute, don't all the houses matter? Mm -hmm. So yes, they do. It's just that right now, this particular one was on fire. And I think that, you know, you're not going to put out that fire overnight either. And I think what it does for this is me personally, what it does is shine a light on the fact, whether you're in the US, which is more of a cute there in some ways, although there's huge issues in the UK as well, criminal justice system we can talk about for, for, for hours, but what it's done is shine a light on the fact that change has hardly occurred at all, potentially even in my lifetime, and it is time for whoever it may be, the powers that be, and people who look like me, people who've got profiles, people who have money, whatever it might be, to stand up and say that you need to change the game and you need to make sure that you are absolutely open the door for everybody, no matter what they look like, what God they believe in, what sexuality they are, what color they are, and the whole list of things. Because until we do that, society is not fair. And the social contract in business, if you go back to a lot of the old philosophers, many of you actually were slave owners, sadly, <laughs> like Kant and those guys, is that you know businesses exist at the behest of society. And unless they're actually delivering value for society, why the hell are they there? And that's what the social contract's about. It's about there's a contract between us and society at large, politicians and organizations to have a fairer society where, you know, our, our shared resources are shared out more fairly. And I'm not talking about communism here. I'm actually a, quite much a sort of a, a, a capitalist, but I think you should have a, a fair society. And we've all got a role to play. And Black Lives Matter is just shining a very bright light on the fact that we're not taking it seriously enough. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, but yeah, as Warren says, it's not, it's not the opposite of white lives matter, it's the opposite of black lives don't matter. Yeah, all these houses in that street, they're all on fire. There's, there's uh, you know, uh, the education of women in uh, third world countries or less developed world, in the less developed world is, you know, there's, um, all sorts of issues in terms of diversity, inclusion, and lack of social mobility, the criminal justice system. There's lots of houses on fire, but you know, you've got to pick your battle sometimes and put out the one you think you can um, you know, put throw the most water on. In my case, I'm more focused on I'd say diversity generally, but mm -hmm. I am 
of black heritage. My mom is a black woman. My, you know, my great, great, great grandfather was a, was a slave. So my family name was given to them because it's from the Bible by a slave owner. So I personally oh, will focus on that. And you mm. have everyone listening to this, um, your own background uh, where you can actually make a difference. And if you had many people, because I've seen like social, um, so seen, seen, <laughs> yeah. um, so seen, seen like the co comments on your social, but like privately behind that, have you if you had people reach out to you and contact you, not just like private individuals, but maybe like media companies asking for for re reaction, and just because again, like you said earlier, because I've been on the telly, that kind of thing. Yeah, a little bit. I, I haven't I haven't turned up on um like you know one of the news channels talking about this quite quite yet. But um, there's been a lot of activity on social media, which is actually in a way I'm quite glad because I wasn't on social media. I'm still not on like Facebook, to be honest with you. But um, yeah. I'm glad I got back on it. We talked about talked about this before because it's given me a channel to kind of to, to vent in some ways, but also to share share my views and my experiences. And a lot of people have come back, and sometimes it's on direct messages, and said, yeah. look, look, because they, they don't want to post it on a public platform. And they said, look, thank you for posting that. It's really made me think about my own bias. Uh, and I'm going to do something about it. And, you know, if one person um, changes their view on how they recruit or on how they're going to um, run their business, then that's, that's the result, isn't it? If we all yeah, did that, yeah. we'd, we'd be in a much better place. Absolutely. But there uh, are people, I have to say, that just completely miss the flipping point. And uh, uh, you, you have to bite, them. Lip. <laughs> I'm bite my lip. On my, my, you probably see on some social media, I haven't bitten my lip. You haven't, no. That's all that. The straight is like, how <laughs> hard is it to understand yeah. You just want to have a fair level playing field. That's it. Yeah. And the, the, the thing is, and a, a, a mate of mine posted this up only last week or so, is that, you know, t taking it down another route, I don't, I don't want to spend hours on here because I'll, I'll let you get off, but it, it was just, you know, down where we, we live here in Pool in Dorset, and it's like probably 99.98%, .98%, you know, white Anglo-Saxon, um, and th this this lad Ben, he he just come back from Necker Island, working for a mutual friend of ours, Richard Branson, as the DJ on Necker Island. Twenty four year old boy, um, dream job probably for a lot of people. And That's my dream job, if mine is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> um, and literally, you know, working with people from you know, and, and be, being that he was a you know a, a, a white. 24 year old male from from Pool and Dorset going out there and, and working with people from all different you know uh, colors and, and um, sexual persuasions and, and all sorts of things um, and he met his girlfriend out there she was a beauty therapist she became pregnant thought I don't want to have a baby um, on Necker Island and bring, bring her up there so let's move back home to mum and he's literally just queuing up in um, in the co-op last week and he said he had his uh on his own with his like three month old baby boy the in baby's his mixed, so the baby's mixed race looks like me uh I think so, yeah the girlfriend black or no 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 so she's white oh, okay, yes yeah. she's white she's white um and he's literally just queuing on his own to get into the co-op because you know it's a queue to get in and he said in front of him is a black male white female and she's pregnant obviously very, very pregnant. And he said, this guy just goes past on a bicycle, stops, gets off, and just starts shouting abuse, literally, yeah. at this couple. And he just said, I I was the only male in the queue. It was just, you know, uh, and, and just other females in the queue waiting to get into the supermarket. And he said, I just didn't know what to do. And literally stood there with the baby in my arms and said, eventually, somebody else came up to, to queue within, you know, seconds and, chase this guy away but it's just so bloody emotive yeah, everyone everyone in that queue sticks head in the sand they don't want to get you know yeah, exactly. you, yeah if everyone in that queue had something to say about that person shouted them down to the extent you want to do that in public um yeah. you would have got away but you know there were a lot of those idiots who are out there there was a small percentage and sadly the the events of recent events mean that they think they've got a right to stick their head out of whatever hole they happen to live in and mm. let people and share their views you know they're not going to you don't get rid of those people, sadly. No, and that, that's what, like when you when you said about you know biting your tongue on, on social. I just sort of kind of seen it, and I see you I'm sort of reading it and thinking, God, you must be really struggling to not say well, something. Well, Did you delete someone? Yeah, well, I, I think it's partly the fact that 
a lot of my posts have been where people they, they just read it and they think oh oh hang on a minute that's me <laughs> and, then, and then they react to it and, and the reaction you actually want is oh yeah he's right actually i i've got i've got bias what everyone has and mm -hmm. you confront it and do something about it uh, rather than just you know say how dare you make me feel like i'm a racist yeah, <laughs> and yeah. that's the thought that goes for the head mm. um so and, and they kind of freak out about it um that, that, that's not the reason but unless we talk about it and we do things like this and people you know great people to join and listen to me rambling on for an hour is yeah it's <laughs> unless you do these things um things aren't going to change yeah and, and i think you're right it's literally just starting the conversations and everybody being able to do something you know everybody being able to you know to voice their opinions without being and not letting it just move on because because one day right it doesn't matter who you are um bias which is the one of the big issues here uh will affect you or will affect mm -hmm. someone you care about or somebody you know or somebody you love or somebody yeah. your children is in a relationship with or your children's children um it will absolutely affect someone down the line somewhere. It doesn't matter what color you are, where you are. I mean, even now, you know, you, I mean, let's face it as well. I, I'm from, I'm a West Indian heritage, right? If you're in the West Indies, you know, they're not particularly, you know, the, I reckon the, if you're gay in the West Indies, you know, you'll, you'll experience a huge amount of animosity. Mm -hmm. So it's not a, it's not a, a thing that white people do to black people and black lives matter. This is an issue for all races and all creeds all over the world. Yeah, agree with you. Yeah, or sexual orientation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, Hundred percent. Um, okay, so kept you on for far too long. Always a pleasure. Um, I think been good. It's interesting. It's a, it's a, it's an interesting time, isn't it? I mean, this, 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 this year, we probably want to forget it, but we're not going to forget it, are we? Because it's, it's, um, it's going to change quite a few things for the rest of our lives. It is, and I mean, my wife literally just said today, I literally cannot believe it's July before we know it. It's going to be August. In theory, kids will be going back to school in September. I've got one in school and one at home. But, but so, let's hope that we come out of it having, you know, we're going to lick, lick some of our wounds. It'll be difficult for, you know, 18 months or so. But hopefully on the other side of that, um, mm -hmm. we're all in a better place. Yeah, yeah, let's hope we are. Let's hope we are. And yeah, if you want to do anything like this again, um, then more than happy to, like I say, Keep these conversations going. That the comments here have been amazing. You can you can see yourself. But it'd be, it'd be interesting to in in like six months time maybe pencil it in and have another mm. chat. Say, is anyone still talking about this? Yeah. And if not, why not? Because that yeah. actually is what the challenge is going to be. It's going mm. to be holding people accountable and making sure that they don't just hope it goes away, stick their head in the sand again, and then in another you know, that my daughters who are my that their mum's white actually, but they. Yeah they like to see themselves as having some heritage that they're mm. not thinking, well, hang on a minute. Why can't I do what it is that I always wanted to do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I mentioned before, you know, when you see it in different arenas and it was, you know, and I'm a big American football fan. So seeing back, you know, four or five years ago now, Colin Capen, you know, t taking a knee during the American anthem, et cetera. And now with the premier league getting started and I saw Dion Dublin, you know, former Man United footballer saying, Oh, is it just bloody, Names on T-shirts again. Here we go again. Yeah. But hopefully in six months' time, the conversation has moved on and there is action, not just conversation. Yeah, because the, the, these the, these triggers will continue to happen. Mm. Yeah, whether it's, um, you know, the criminal justice system, the numbers, whether it's UK boardrooms, whether it's diversity in the workplace generally, whether it's, um, you know, the US police force, you know, murdering people in the street. These triggers are not going to go away. It's a question of are we going to um use them as triggers for change yeah absolutely triggers for change yeah simon what an interesting down-to-earth conversation this is thank you um and janet smith morrison is also to get the older generation talking about it again well it's uh, quite interesting i was just thought we're gonna be all day actually so anyone wants to go feel free <laughs> so, <laughs> my, my mom, you know, it's interesting for her because for the you know, first time in quite a long time I and mean, my brother we've been talking to my mum about it and saying well what was mm. that thinking you were a nurse and you know and you hear her stories and she finds it you know she, she was always worried for us that we wouldn't be able to you know do whatever we wanted to do because of the, the color of our skin um yeah. so it's been interesting actually talking to parents from her generation about her she left barbados at the end of the day to become a nurse in the nhs because she wanted to work in finance in a bank in barbados unless you were white you know in that in those days that wasn't going to happen huh 
That's so she wasn't a nurse that's in Barbados. She... So, so you know, that's that's obviously changed. But um, you know, there are parents worried about uh, whether their children can actually be everything they can be, and that's just nonsense. Mm, yeah, agree. Um, okay, yeah, we could we could be here all day. Um, so we will we will draw it to a close. Quarter past three. So we have overrun. So those of you who've, who've had to leave, uh, do apologise. Um, and you can watch this is always a common question replay literally as soon as I press end broadcast here everybody um, you'll be able to watch the replay if you found this really useful then simply share the link with other people who you think will find this of value um, also going to be putting this out on the screw it just do it podcast which I host next Tuesday as well um, so that'll go out to a bigger audience uh, as well again so uh, Janet Smith, shining a light on what Piers has already said, change has already been achieved even in our lifetime. Um, report card must do better. <laughs> All right. Well, Piers, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for having me. You're and welcome. thank you everyone for um, tuning in. Awesome. Enjoy the Bye. rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Cheers, Piers. Bye-bye.